So let's get into some of the gemmier minerals now. I think this back half of the class is really fun because we start getting into things that are common gemstones. So here we have the sorosilicates and the cyclosilicates. Um, we have three barrel up here in the corner, epidote down here, and tourmaline over here. Um, and all of these, especially if you just watch the videos for the pyroxenes and amphiboles with the inosilicates, we're going to bump it up with the hardness level. And now all of these samples are going to fall at least a six on the hardness scale, with barrel being the hardest here, coming in at about an eight. Um, another more common name for barrel, this blue variety here is called aquamarine. And then you might know the common green variety. Well, it's a rare variety, but emerald yay we obviously don't have any emeralds here but we're gonna stick this is a really nice aquamarine I'm not gonna be scratching that but we'll stick with these blue ones over here for working and then we also have tourmaline over here another really common gemstone um, I think that epidote maybe doesn't fall under the gemstone category but that's okay um, so in general, we're going to bump up the hardness with all of these. They're all really hard. Um, let's see. I mean, with this one here, this piece of barrel, I should be able to scratch a piece of glass like nobody's business. Let's do the test here. Find a good piece of the glass. All right. I mean, that was barely any effort at all. And this big old scratch right there. And so this will be pretty common for all of these that are in front of me. Um, tourmaline comes in at about 7, 7.5. So that's another thing to think about when we think about gemstones is that they do have to be hard enough to kind of last um, for them to be commonly used gemstones. So things like beryl that have emerald and aquamarine, tourmaline here, they're all pretty hard. Um, and you can see that commonly they all do have a vitreous luster. They're very glassy. I can see that reflection off of the surface. Um, this one here, even though it's black, very high reflectivity. Um, even this epidote, when I have a nice crystal of it here, I still get that vitreous luster. And I think this is common in a lot of the silicates. Um, so really common hardnesses, all very hard. We have that similar luster going on here. They're all moderate to moderately low um, density. So nothing's really dense or sticking out here. Um, but all three of these do have different crystal systems. So let's just get started with um, barrel up here in the corner. And so um, these kind of really light colors, really common. Um, you'll see a common thread through all of this. That color does help us um, with a little bit of the silicates here. And now, as we've said, barrel can clearly be a bunch of different colors. I can have this light blue. I can have white. I can have, you know, green. But even if this had the tiniest bit of green in it, the value would just skyrocket. It would not be something I'd have sitting on my desk right now. Um, but so this kind of blue color here and now all of this is host rock this is probably some kind of feldsbar and some kind of horn blend or biotite or something like that but we just want to focus on this blue crystal here if i look right down here the c axis i can see one two three this is a hexagonal mineral if i could see the whole rest of it um it would be hexagonal i could see a little bit right there it's a little bit harder um, but that's just because this is still in the matrix rock. Let's take a look at the really nice aquamarine. I mean, this thing is so see-through and nice. And in these things, the deeper the color, the more prized they are. So in actuality, the sample's not incredibly um, expensive. But if we look down this, let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a hexagonal prism, and this is really common, hexagonal prism with these pinacoid terminations. This one's kind of broken and busted up here, but this is a really common form um, for barrel to take. And now think back to something like corundum. Um, they're pretty um, similar to each other. I do find that... Um, Corundum definitely doesn't have striations on the side usually. We could see that we have this kind of like busted up, broken up pattern. And then these lighter colors are a lot more favored. Um, so that's barrel here. I'm trying to think if we had anything else to say about it. I mean, it's another one of those hexagonal minerals. So always take that into account because we've got, you know, quite a few on our list now. 
So let's go down to epidote, which is actually a monoclinic mineral. Um, you can kind of probably have guessed that considering that we've got some beautiful crystal forms here and we don't have a lot going on over here. Epidote is almost always this pistachio green kind of brownish color. Um, let's compare it really quickly to something like diopside just so we can get a color comparison. So this beautiful diopside crystal, euhedral, and then epidote. Definitely very different, right? This is yellowy, brown, kind of earthy toned, and this is very like gemmy and bright. So that's something to keep um, in mind. And also, if we look at the, this one it has, um, it's like polycrystalline, microcrystalline. We can see very tiny little crystal faces. Even that has the exact same color here. Epidote, um, but still has that nice vitreous luster. Um, so the way that I usually distinguish this, color is a dead giveaway. The fact that I don't have a euhedral crystal of it, also a dead giveaway. It just doesn't commonly form that. Um, and having these kind of, you know, aggregates is something that's really common. Um, getting these really nice beautiful crystals that are large it's just not something that you're going to see for epidote um, but it's a really um, important mineral for petrology and things like that but as far as using it for diagnostic um, for just for diagnostic properties this is just look at the color honestly and then over here the last one we have tourmaline tourmaline is really fun this is actually a trigonal mineral um, and so if we look down here look at that euhedral crystal I mean that's perfect threefold axis right there and tourmaline likes to form these kind of stubby uh, black crystals this is called a variety called shoral um, and so this kind of stubby but euhedral crystal form is really common for these black tourmalines. Um, these are also a little bit brittle, they can be. This one's likely not because it's so euhedral. But then this one here, m you can see that there's a little bit of breakage. Um, all of these are kind of lacking really easy to identify cleavage. Um, we could see some striations right there, that's exciting on a crystal face. It's always nice. Helps us to know we're looking at a crystal face, right? There's some more on this side. And you can see that this one is a really nice euhedral one. This one, not so much. Um, and tourmaline can be a variety of different colors. One thing, though, that helps me distinguish tourmaline from something like beryl or corundum, those are usually all the same color. There is not a lot of variability in a single crystal. If we look at something like this, it's just this clear, very, very light blue. Even this sample, I can see like a little bit of white and blue, but it's pretty homogenous all the way through color wise. Tourmaline can be, have huge variability. Um, even just in a sample like this, so this one's green, we can see those nice striations. Yay, that's very common in tourmaline. Um, I've got this nice green color. When I turn it on the end here though, I have pink. And that's real, that's not another mineral that's there. Um, if this had a little bit more pink to it and it came out to the sides, we would call this a watermelon tourmaline, um, literally because it's pink and green. But this kind of like color variation in just a singular crystal, think back to like fluorite or something like that, where we could see those bands of purple and blue. So this mineral a tourmaline can also change colors or it has um, a lot of different colors in a single sample. So that that's quite unique. This one here is an example of what tourmaline would look like if it was actually still, you know, these tiny crystals. I'm looking at the pink crystals here in some kind of metamorphic rock. Um, this is what it would look like if it was still in this matrix, but I just wanted you to see the variation in color that we can have. We can have something black, we can have this green with a little bit of pink, we can have totally pink. So tourmaline, using just color alone to help you is not really going to work out. Barrel, it's something we can do a little bit easier. We know the popular varieties. Epidote's always going to be this pistachio green color. Tourmaline can have a lot of different colors. And so using this like euhedral 
crystal shape, which is really common for it. It also likes to grow in these like elongated rods almost. You can even see that just on these tiny little crystals. Um, crystal habit is really, really important for tourmaline. And let's see, what else do we have? We said that they're all hardness is really high. We've got, you know, moderate density. Um, I can tell you right now that this definitely feels pretty darn dense, but not as dense as if I had something like, you know, galena in my hand or pyrite in my hand, but I can feel the density a little bit. Um, and they all have different crystal systems, right? We have hexagonal, trigonal, and monoclinic here. Um, and out of these three, these should be quite easy to identify, um, either based on euhedral crystals or color alone. And those are the sorosilicates and cyclosilicates on our list.